Dr. Kassam, as a gastroenterologist, you've probably seen a lot of really interesting things, but one of the areas that's been emerging that's interesting to me is the link between our gut health and actual body composition, like gut health and fat loss and improving the effects of maybe a diet or... It, can we kind of give an overview of how that, how that potentially works? Uh, and then maybe we can dive into mechanisms and some other stuff there. Absolutely. So let's take a step back and like start the landscape of where this field went from a microbiome and metabolism perspective. And I think probably the first study that unlocked everyone's brain uh, was a really elegant study uh, out of the University of Washington, Pete Turnbaugh and Jeff Gordon did. And they, they took mice and never seen bacteria before. And they uh, found a set of twins, uh, human twins. Uh, one was obese and one was really like lean, pretty skinny. And they took the bacteria from the, the humans and put them into the mice. They took the you know, skinny stool and put it into the, the mouse, and the mouse got skinny. And they took the obese stool uh, and put it into the mouse, uh, and the mouse got obese. And everyone was like, like, what's going on here? That's like wild. Like, how can that possibly be? And it's like, this has set us off on a bit of a journey on understanding how the microbiome interfaces with metabolism. The hypothesis uh, at the time um, has evolved to know what it, where it is now. So one hypothesis at the time was, is perhaps the microbes that are going through, sorry, the, the food that's going through the gut that usually just gets passed through you, if you have a set of obese microbiome, that it is able to take that caloric intake from things that would otherwise pass through your system and give it to the host, confer more caloric um, reservoir for the host and therefore more, more mass versus a lean individual where that byproduct just goes right through you and it, and it doesn't really matter. That was the hypothesis at first. The hypothesis is changing over time, but that was kind of was initially kind of evaluated. And so there's been a set of like human experiments actually with cl in clinical trials for uh, something very crude. So we'll take a we'll take a detour in a second um, called on something called fecal transplants. And so uh, I'll take a step back. I I met the microbiome in a very different way. Um, I had a patient that had a terrible case of uh, a terrible gut infection, and we ended up doing a fecal transplant on her, and she was like gardening two days later, and this like set us on a journey of doing a lot of fecal transplants as a way to understand cause and effect, mm -hmm. uh, but in humans. And so a, a very smart group in, um, in Europe, uh, Max Newdorp, did a, did a study actually in, in metabolic syndrome with fecal transplants. And he took basically skinny stool <laughs> uh, from a healthy donor and put it into individuals that had metabolic syndrome. And they saw an improvement in the metabolic uh, factors, which is really interesting in their insulin sensitivity, basically. Um, very complicated study, but it was very, very compelling. Um, so it kind of mimics a little bit around um, around metabolism. A couple of studies, one in which I did and one in which actually I did was done at Med Mass General Hospital, um, have started to look at fecal transplants and obesity. And I think the data is not quite there yet, but it's starting to get a little bit closer because it's probably not the thesis around food kind of going through you, but rather around the biology related to GLP-1. Yeah. What's... For a long time, it's been you kind know, of discussion of what firmicutes and and bacteroids, uh, bacter however you say that one always puzzles me. But where one was more, I think firmicutes is associated with obesity, and there was that was for a long time, and it's still to this day referenced a lot. But are those really the primary bacteria anymore, or have things shifted away from that discussion? Things have really shifted. I think there's a really nice review uh, this past year in, in the Journal of Nutrients that really asked that question. Is this still the hallmark for obesity, this ratio that everyone keeps citing? And they did a very thorough review of an analysis of the literature um, globally, actually looked at uh, many different countries and, and, and many different studies. And the resounding answer is no, it's not conclusive. And there's too many confounding variables that this really isn't the driver. And that's an association, right? And I think what really drives kind of science for is not just, you know, chicken or the egg, but like, what's the actual biology? What's the actual pathway that we're hitting that leads to potential changes? And then test that in a, in a rigorous way. So where are we at right now? <laughs> so there's, so there's, you know, there's this master molecule um, called butyrate, uh, super important um, uh, molecule that is made by bacteria, certain bacteria, uh, they're church church chain fatty acids. And this, this butyrate, um, molecule has a really important me metabolic impact. It actually interfaces with the cells in your gut, um, something called L cells that produce, um, GLP-1, 
Now, intestinal GLP-1, a little bit different than what, you know, all the rage is with, uh, you know, GLP-1 injections for systemic effect. And this GLP-1 interfacing um, allows uh, connection to the vagus nerve. And uh, studies are starting, to, are starting to emerge that 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 actually is another pathway for decreasing satiety, so decreasing appetite, um, which has become one of the more leading hypotheses that's going on in the microbiome metabolic world. That's kind of one. The second one is that multi, the, that obesity and and metabolic conditions are are multifactorial, and although there are many factors that go into it, uh, an additional one is actually low grade chronic inflammation. And so, an inflammatory cascade um, is being targeted by by many groups as a additional new mechanism of action for individuals with obesity. And so, that's another pathway in which you're being evaluated. What about from the standpoint of, of insulin resistance as well? Because I know that the you know, butyrate, the propionate, all these like short chain fatty acids play a very critical role in how glucose is utilized and signaling there. What are we starting to uncover within the recent years there? That's exactly right. And I think that's the study that I was referenced with uh, with with Max Newdorp is that there's a huge impact through butyrate to that pathway for insulin sensitivity. We're seeing those results through that that exact same pathway for how we're um, how we're dealing with our sugars essentially, right? And so I think that's something that's particularly exciting is not just the mass, but also the metabolic capability. What about even um, like muscle protein synthesis and the potential for muscle building? Are we starting to see anything there? Yeah, we are. It's, I think it's, you know, a couple of different things. So maybe talk about the biology and the preclinical and the clinical. So the biology, so the hypothesis is that, is that certain microbes have the ability to improve um, anabolic capability. So helping break down proteins in a more effective and effective manner. And I think that's one piece of it. And that's the corollary is certain microbes help prevent catabolism in a bad way in an inflammatory way. So that's kind of what the hypothesis was. And so there was a really interesting preclinical study, a mouse study, uh, where they took um, kind of high functioning, strong <laughs> uh, elderly individuals and low functioning, weak um, uh, elderly individuals, humans, um, defined by group strength. Um, and they put them into a bunch of germ-free mice, the same kind of mice that I was telling you about earlier, and something like remarkable happened. The group that got the um, high-functioning, strong <laughs> uh, microbes uh, based, became stronger, and the other ones didn't, essentially based on mouse group strength. <laughs> oh. um, and so that was kind of a really kind of a fascinating study to show and then there's been a really, it was a nice study by, on the human side, on the, um, it was a meta-analysis, systematic meta-analysis, aggregating a lot of data out of uh, the UK, Norwich University, and show that actually probiotics seem to be, some probiotics are seem to be associated and linked towards um, increasing grip strength in the elderly population. So that's kind of starting to see some of that data kind of translate, although uh, kind of still emerging. Interesting. What, what would your hypothesis be from a, like a mechanistic standpoint? Like, what is that? you think is doing? Like, why would you get stronger from your microbiome? I think it's, I think it's back to like, are we able to optimize protein breakdown okay. better? So kind of what I was talking before is like anabolic. Are we optimizing the protein that's getting, you know, into our cells effectively um, and, and our, into our building blocks? And if certain micros are able to do that more. And then similarly, are we decreasing the, the catabolism, the breakdown um, by, by avoiding microbes that are inflammatory in nature. What about from a fatty acid oxidation perspective? Any, any evidence there from fat burning? Ah, there's, there is some data that's starting to emerge around fat burning and there's like white adipose versus brown adipose and, and thinking about that. I think that data is still pretty early, I would say, on the directionality of it. There isn't the same, there's a cross-sectional data, meaning we see differences, but we don't know you yet know the causal pathway yeah. yet. But it's interesting. No, it's totally interesting. And and just because you have an increase in fat oxidation doesn't necessarily mean you're, or it does literally mean you're burning fat, but it doesn't mean you're burning fat in the sense that people might think, right? Correct. Like you can improve just by improving lipid profiles and by improving glucose oxidation, you a lot of times improve fatty acid oxidation and just the ability to substrate switch, so to speak, at yeah. a mitochondrial level. One of the areas I find particularly interesting, we talked about a little offline, is um, the microbiome of an athlete versus a non-athlete. Like super fascinating. The I think I believe it's pronounced is it Villanella? Villanella. Villanella. Yeah. Um, can you, if you are familiar with that study, just get yeah. an overview of that because it's just so fascinating. Yeah, there's a study done by um, Alice Kostich and Jonathan Scheiman at um, Harvard Medical School, um, and they looked essentially at, at athletes. Um, and um, they were able to identify that certain athletes 
um, are able to break down lactic acid better than others. Um, and the key bugs that helped them do that was these Fianella species, uh, which they thought were, were really powerful. And so they actually turned that into a, into an innovation and, um, and, and started to test that out um, in terms of, of kind of where they're going. Um, they're, they're, it's, it's an interesting space for performance because I think it makes a ton of sense. It's like, yes, of course, we're like, you know, marathon runners have a, a different way of metabolizing you know, lactic acid. And so I think their, their, their work there is really incredible. Did they do any transplant with that? Did they test it? Is that what that study went down? Did they like take marathon runners and take that bacteria and put it in a, I can't, a mouse model? I can't remember what. I don't they think they did the testing directly in that way in terms of like mouse model swapping the way that I've said. Um, but I think it was a, a kind of a clear pathway from a, from a biology perspective. It was a nature medicine paper a while ago. Yeah. And that might just be the, the tip of the iceberg with that yeah. too, right? It's like, I think it comes down to this efficiency and ability to uh, break down byproducts and break down waste products too. You know, it's like when you look at, I don't view lactic acid as a late waste product. I mean, it's very functional from the, yeah. you know, um, all kinds of different cycles that you're going to use it for, for energy metabolism. But I think that people forget that, that there's this element of, okay, what are you extracting from your food, but also what are you able to metabolize, recycle, eliminate, things like that. Are there bacteria that are more how do I put this, more prone to help waste elimination compared to absorption, for example. Like, are there strains of bacteria that help us move particles out? And the reason I say that, and it's a little divergence from what we're talking about right now, but from the perspective of like microplastics and things like that that are moving through, are there bacteria that can help us expedite removal of those? This is a really interesting area of science. There's um, uh, specifically around microplastics and they're able to kind of break down. There's there's some really uh, interesting data from a Turkish gastroenterologist who looked at a certain set of microbes still very early um, that are actually able to break down microplastics and actually kind of sequester them and then eliminate them. And so I think that's an area of ongoing science. Same with heavy metals. There's some interesting data that's talking about microbes being able to maybe potentially impact heavy metals. So the science is really still maturing there, mm -hmm. but it's an area that I'm keeping my fingers on the pulse very, very closely because it's uh, super important. Uh, yeah. Can you imagine a world where we have an ability to actually have augment, you know, our lived environment uh, with, with an environmental solution? Um, that's it's very exciting. It's what is it? Uh, bile as bile acid uh, sequestration or something? I think is what it is. That is right? that, and that we do. The, the, we know of many of our microbes that do that in some ways. We do that. So secondary bile acids essentially are produced by many microbes, and that's actually what's helping for people that have that C diff condition I was mentioning before. I uh, have terrible diarrhea. It's really working through a pathway related to bile acids. Yeah, because they can essentially. I, I think that's what I've seen. At least uh, the paper that I read just last week on it was like you know, bile acids can bind to well fat soluble toxins, but that also including like MNPs, right? Like some of these mi micro and nanoparticles of plastic, yeah. which may not like remove them from your body, but if you can expedite their transit through the Ouch. gut, because I think we've seen other literature that suggested like the microplastics do absorb just like food, right? yep. basically. So it's like, it's just fascinating. I think that like that's a good point on elimination. So here's something kind of interesting. So um, there are certain bacteria in the gut that have the genetic code to be able to metabolize estrogen. So here's here's a here's a the thesis. So estrogen normally in women um, produce ovaries, actually gets conjugated and then deconjugated in your liver, and then it gets excreted out your into your poop, uh, essentially. But certain microbes in the right context are able to convert that uh, inactive estrogen to an active estrogen to then confer to the host. And so, you know, there's a, there's a thesis around potentially, um, you know, in certain microbes can actually potentially, you know, uh, increase uh, estrogen for perimenopausal women. So that's kind of an interesting area as well for certain microbes. So it seems as though, I mean, people are always looking for a takeaway. I mean, if you had to give people from a metabolic standpoint, uh, what would the takeaway be as far as gut health? And I'm sure it's probably similar for, a, uh, you know, a person that's just looking at general gut health, but from a body composition, fat oxidation, glucose metabolism, like what strains would you recommend people kind of focus on? And like maybe what are a couple of foods that people could focus on? Yeah. So I think overall, I think that the key thing to take away for, for this occasion is butyrate. Okay. Butyrate is the most important driver of metabolic health and general gut health in many different ways. That's number one. Number two, how do you increase your butyrate, right? I think there's two kind of paths there to, to think about. One, you can increase the prebiotics that help drive butyrate. So for example, uh, inulin, which is found in um, 
Jerusalem artichokes and leeks, for example, from terms of Whole Foods. Um, pectin found in apples, uh, rye and whole wheats. These are all things that have been dr- driven to increase beta. In fact, even some dark chocolates mm-hmm. have been shown to increase uh, specifically beta. Rate. The second piece is augmenting um, your diet, su- supplementing your diet with uh, probiotics that increase beta rate. So DSO one actually or just presented data or sorry, just submitted data that suggests that DSO one is actually increasing beta rate, which I think is a really important piece of the story as well. So I think those are the two elements to think about: what you can optimize in your diet, but also recognize that you need to have the bugs there to begin with, uh, bugs that increase beta rate. For example, that's an example. So, so. I think it's helpful for people because I think it's. Although diversity is important, when you talk about diversity to people, it's not, it lacks the specificity that people sometimes want when it comes to adherence. They go, okay, you're telling me just to eat diverse, so you want me to eat the blue Doritos and the red ones? Like, that's like diversity. <laughs> sure. But like being able to give the specificity of like, okay, how do we eat more butyrate producing, I'm not saying butyrate producing foods, but foods that encourage the production of exactly. butyrate, right? Um, and I think that that is extremely important, extremely helpful because people could even list do a Google search on that. Yeah. Like, okay, how do I increase these foods? Because they want this, what is this end result? What are, where is the end of this cascade? And I think when people understand those short chain fatty acids and how those act as signaling devices within the body, yep. it's a little bit more digestible, no pun intended for it, right? Like <laughs> they, it's like, okay, I eat this food. Sure, it's good for my gut. I don't really care about what's going on in my gut because I can't see it, feel it, or touch it, right? It's yep. just there, right? Yeah. But when I actually think about, okay, well, what are they producing yep. that acts as a signal to help my body actually function better in a way that I can actualize. Absolutely. And, and not only on the met, met, metabolic side of the house, through that GLP-1 pathway, but that barrier function that we talked about, it's super important, actually decreasing inflammation uh, and the inflammatory cascade, something called HDAC. Um, and so for all the reasons, butyrate to me, like that's the one place and it's best to have a factory of bugs that actually produce it For kind sure. of naturally. And the diversity is good. The reason why I mentioned that before is because there's cross-feeding then those sub elements are required potentially for those butyrate producing organisms to do their job. And so I think I think that specificity is important, but in a broader context. Uh, so real quickly, is cro- cross feeding is like like okay, bacteria break down food, produce something, and then gets cross fed on that. Is that exactly? So there's cert- so say so for example, you have like I don't know two set two bugs. One's a butyrate producing organism. One is a bystander. I'll call it okay. the um, the food actually goes to the bystander who converts that food into a metabolite that the butyrate producing organism needs to grow directly, that produces butyrate. Uh-huh. So the the microbiome is complex in that way. So there's interrelationships, but you need to know you have to have the right ecosystem around that butyrate producing organism. In isolation, it won't get the necessary cross-feeding byproducts required for it to grow. That's fascinating. Yeah. Okay. I've never really heard it described like that. Yeah. That's yeah, like, I'm trying to think of it struggling to find an analogy for that. I'm trying to think like, okay, if you have a person that's doing something, but I'll have to think on that one. <laughs> but it's, uh, I've always thought of cross-feeding as, yeah, essentially you've got, okay, if you eat an onion and you get that prebiotic effect and that bacteria is sort of producing something, then the the bystander has then has the ability to utilize it. But it kind of sounds like it's almost the opposite. It's like the bystander utilizes it so that the, the main the main focus, the main bacteria can then do its job. Exactly. Okay. And it's probably, it's feeding both, but directly there, the, both components are necessary, right? Uh, I think it's uh, it's an important piece. It sometimes gets missed when we talk about the microbiome. Yeah, no, yeah. for sure. It's definitely a more advanced sure. topic when you're talking about the microbiome for the lay person. But, uh, well, Doc, where can everyone find you and where can everyone find DSO-1? Absolutely. So, uh, so you can find me at uh, Dr. Zane Says, Dr. Z-A-I-N-S-A-Y-S uh, on X and then on, on LinkedIn as well. And then um, find us at C.com. Right on. Okay. Thank you, brother.